Should we get started? Here we go. Yes, I'm ready for you, my friend. All right, let's do this. No, we're not doing this. Hello, we we are doing an intro first. We are not jumping into debating right away. Uh, you're, you're right. We don't say hello and and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, you right? said you, let's. And how you, are you? You said let's do this. This is international code for first round. Oh, since you talk about international codes, I discovered, to my great surprise, and that's again instead of saying hello to our listeners, but we'll say hello to hello, all of hello. you. But let's talk about international codes. Uh, I discovered uh, about, I think, was it 300 Swiss airplane pilots uh, were grounded because they don't speak English. Uh, apparently, there's a new there's a new regulation that was uh, that took into effect uh, that was uh, put in place and requires pilots who speak English, which is kind of the international standard. And then they said uh, to a uh, Swiss pilot, "Come on, say something in English to me." And then he tried, and they said, "No, that's not English. <laughs> not good enough. Yeah, it must be Schweizerdeutsch or French or something else. I, I suspect it's not commercial uh, airplane pilots. It must be small." Oh, shit. Uh, small aircraft. Um. All right. So I thought it's not recording, but in fact, looks like it is. And this is, right. this is this is a, such an amazing story. Um, uh, how many again? I think three hundred fifty or something. I I shared it uh, with family yesterday. Let me see. Where is this? Crazy. Uh, Swiss pilots grounded for not. Sp- Speaking English. Here it is. <laughs> we have no. Sorry, it was a 130 oh, well pilots then. have been grounded at regional airports in Switzerland due to their inability to speak English because of a new directive which came into force on the 20th of June, stating that if you're taking off or landing at Swiss airports, that you have to be able to communicate exclusively I mean, in English. I, I have to make that joke now. I'm sorry for all our listeners uh, that are fellow countrymen of yours, but sh- wouldn't we all expect that to happen to French pilots? Uh, they manage uh, <laughs> with, uh, with a bit of an accent, but uh, you manage to speak English. Oh, uh, uh, oui. Right. Oh, uh, oui. Jean Paris, right? Whatever, whatever people know of French language. Yeah, uh, actually, it's more like oh, yeah, French. <laughs> All right, French. Yeah, French people manage. I guess no. What was very striking in Switzerland? It is true that at least in my little village where I live, uh, half of the time there's no way that speaking English will get you through. Whether it's like you know, taxes, stuff, work permits, <laughs> grocery shopping. You have to speak German or but Swiss it's German. Like, it feels like the Swiss of all people have like the whole zoo of national languages, right? They, they, they have their own, they have French, they have Italian, they have German. It's a bit of a weird omission that English of all languages is the one they don't speak. Fair enough. Uh, but here's the thing. It's also true that few Swiss people speak all the languages. Mm-hmm. Right? They're just spoken in different parts of Switzerland but few of them actually speak more than their language of where they're, which region they're from. So, and even, even if they do learn French at school, like for the German speaking part, they lose it because they never practice it. So with things like that happen, can we then say Switzerland is a rogue nation in Europe? You did it again. <laughs> How wonderful. <laughs> Now elaborate why you would say Switzerland is a rogue nation. <laughs> the, the beauty of this is that uh, it's not forced at all, right? It's <laughs> Not false at all. But elaborate. What makes you think it would be a rogue nation in terms of uh, languages? Um, uh, I could go go even one step deeper and say, is Switzerland part of the axis of evil in Europe? But that, that's probably going too far, right? Um, well, in the case of Switzerland, as we all know, or at least I guess most of us know, it, it has remained a neutral state for what, like a thousand years? Has not engaged into any war? It just collected the gold. Yes. <coughs> uh, just, uh, through this. <laughs> just is getting rich on everybody else's <laughs> expense, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're neutral. We'll take the money from either side. Not a problem. <laughs> you you fight it between yourselves. <laughs> we'll keep your money in the meantime, right? <laughs> And if you're dead, well, we'll keep yeah, the it's money. It's very selfless. I, 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 I applaud that. Yeah, so why, why did I make that... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> why? I wonder. Why did you make that comment about a rogue state? A rogue state? <laughs> because we're going to debate about a rogue state, silly. You know that. You wrote the debating motion. Um, uh, the one that you yes. Love. Um, so the motion you suggested for today's debate was. Uh, Iran is a rogue state lurking in the shadows. Yeah, they're lurking in the shadows just for the emotional. <laughs> it's just for the emotional thing, you know, the flavor. Of yeah, I, ever since I wonder how a state is lurking in a shadow, and uh, I imagine you walking past the state and it jumps from behind. Uh, that's maybe just my. Is it? Isn't it what's happening? <laughs> my comic fantasy. I don't know what what inspired you to put that motion into our motion sheet. Uh, may <coughs> excuse me. Mainly because uh, Iran was in the news lately with the U.S. military drone, uh, which was gunned down by Iran, and was uh, and Iran admitted that it gunned down the drone. Except there's controversy as to whether the drone, the military drone, was over international waters or over Iranian airspace. Additionally, a few weeks prior to that, uh, a few oil tankers have been attacked um, in, uh, next to the Iranian coast international oil tankers, Iran denies being involved, the US claims Iran is involved, and Iran has always been in the news, right, as, and presented as an evil country. Um, so I was wondering, hey, maybe it's time to talk about Iran. Um, there's a lot of attention focused on North Korea, Iran, Saudi Arabia these days, and I don't know, war, war could always start or be triggered because of random events, so I thought it'd be interesting to start exploring her a little bit, even if, as you mentioned, off the record, we're no experts, but we, did a, we do a little bit of research, we, re we read the news and we try to summarize all these thoughts and try to see whether there's one side which would be maybe stronger than the other and we may indicate whether it's likely or not that uh, we would be engaging in a war, although that's not the debate exactly today, but I think that's the, the risk that, we, that, that is implicit to this debate. Yeah, that's right. So... The lurking in the shadow part is for emotions. Okay, I'm sad now because I was hoping I can can put uh, some debating capital behind showing that there is not that much shadow in Iran and that they cannot really lurk in shadows. But uh, that's clearly just for the emotional value now that I understand. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going <laughs> to elaborate on that or make a connection on the lurking in the shadows. It's just, I don't know, it just came with the flow. Um <laughs> I guess I could have stopped the. We could have stopped the motion title to it. Iran is a rogue country. Uh, the extra bit was just for the literary effect. Yeah. So you mentioned I'm not feeling completely at ease with the topic simply because researching it, it becomes pretty clear that there are two things at play. First, it's a massively complex situation in Iran, and secondly, the kind of media we can read and understand because it's not in Arabic, <laughs> is a little bit simplifying things. That's what it felt to me researching it. So a lot of people are not experts either. But as, as we are not stopped debating it just because we are not experts, people are not stopped writing about it because they are not experts. So everybody has an opinion. And it's a bit, it felt a bit hard to, to find, to, to differentiate truth from fact. Um, that's what I felt reading up on the motion. But anyway, it's not stopping us from consuming, as you said, the media and having an opinion and having arguments to look at. And uh, the flip of the coin landed me on the side of defending the motion. So I will say, yes, it is a rogue state. And you are going to be the, the one defending Iran. As you have a history to, you, you, you enjoy defending things like throwing nuclear bombs on countries. Um, <laughs> states like North Korea are close to your heart. So it's, a, it's just a natural fit that now you defend Iran. My dear friend uh, Kim will be very pleased to, to hear that. Um, just, just one correction to what you mentioned uh, Iran actually, the language of Iran is not Arabic, it's Farsi, and it's actually slightly different from Arabic. Uh, it's actually a very different group, um, origin group. It's Indo-European language, for, and, and Arabic is is more from the African continent uh, initially, yeah. or African Middle Eastern continent. Uh, so even though it's the Middle East, 
uh, there's this, and and it's a Muslim country. It's actually not Arabic, but that's a minor but, detail. Yeah, just to correct you're, you. You're absolutely correct, but that's not the point because you know it's a rogue state, so they are not writing that much trustworthy facts about themselves in Farsi. <laughs> so for the information, you have to turn to other sources, which often are in other languages. <laughs> wow, very very nice uh, uh, saving face here. Very very nice. I have to. <laughs> Chapeau, like we say in French. <laughs> well done. All right, you get started. You got your two minutes. You're allowed to speak English, though, international language. Otherwise, you'll be yes. grounded for the next That's, two weeks. Uh, yeah, thankfully, I, I manage, uh, at least as well as uh, Swiss people, I guess, Swiss pilots. Let's see how well you do. <laughs> because, because we have to tell our listeners, for you, it's 6 a.m. and you're in the U.S. and you just landed about 24 hours ago or 36 hours ago, so... Kudos to you. Let's see how, how well you do with that mumbling, jumping I, words. Yeah, the listener has to decide and you can give me feedback. So if the listener finds this episode in their podcatcher, that means I didn't mumble that much. Or or you convinced right. me that I didn't mumble that much, depending on, okay. on <laughs> preferences. Anyway. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first. And argues for the motion. Is Iran a rogue state? That question begs a question. What is a rogue state exactly? So for all purposes, if you if you read through our current Western media landscape, it sounds like trying to have a nuclear bomb qualifies as being a rogue state. I'm not in that boat, honestly. I do feel there are so many countries out there we recognize as not being rogue states that just because you try to have a nuclear bomb or maybe even threaten with it doesn't qualify you as a rogue state per se. What is uh, qualifying you though is if you are a force for chaos and conflict in a region or in case of Iran even globally. How, how come? Why is that? Iran is a kind of complex uh, Iran is a complex political system. There are multiple powerhouses. There are even multiple armies in Iran and what turns Iran into a force for conflict and a source of uh, violence and death in not only the region Iran is central to is that it has an explicit state policy that is at odds with everything we value and see as important in the Western world. For instance, Iran hates Israel and says so over and over again in public announcements. Highest officials state that Israel needs to be wiped off the map if needed with force. That, is, that alone is a source of conflict. Iran is uh, kind of the arch enemy of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is another powerhouse in the region. And Iran is fighting with Saudi Arabia. All of this would, even, even all of this would not qualify Iran as a rogue state per se. The problem is the way Iran fights. Because Iran spends hundreds of millions of dollars beefing up terrorist organization all across the region, in fact, all across the, ro uh, the world. And by now is connected to literally thousands of terrorist attacks that killed tens of thousands of people, all with the purpose to destabilize countries they want to see wiped off the map. This is why Iran is a rogue nation and this is why Iran is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his argument. It is true that Iran is no democracy. It treats political prisoners badly. It is also questionable when it comes to funding some international organizations. What is a rogue, rogue state? It is a country which threatens world peace, according to one of the US national security advisors 25 years ago. And it lumped Iran together with Cuba, with North Korea, uh, with Iraq and the Saddam Hussein back then. But to be fair, Iran is a scapegoat for the US because the US itself is aligning itself with other very questionable countries like Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia and Iran hate each other for historical and religious reasons. 
But if you look more closely at Saudi Arabia, this strong ally from the US, it's a country where the crown prince has been recognized by multiple institutions, including the UN or the CIA, as having murdered a journalist in its Istanbul embassy. The US has always meddled with Iranian politics, the 1953 coup to overthrow the government and imposing an autocratic ruler called the Shah. Sounds familiar? Yeah, of course it sounds familiar. The US has tried to do this in, in many, many countries around the world during and after the Cold War. The US has a problem with Islam, not Iran. Because Iran has veered to a form of religion that is fairly strict, it's easy, to, it's easy for the US to paint Iran as an enemy. But again, Saudi Arabia is probably worse off when it comes to religious, religious extremism. The US has a problem with Iran because 1979 was a revolution, an anti-imperialist revolution, an anti-Western country revolution. The US has a problem with Iran because Iran has regional influence and firmly opposes the Israeli government, which is not something easy to do when the US is backing the Israeli government. The US has a problem with Iran because Iran has the capacity or already is a nuclear power. Most European countries, on the contrary, don't have a problem with Iran, but because the US bans trade with Iran, has sanctions on Iran, that means any transaction in US dollars is subject to the ban. And any non-American company doing business with Iran has to follow this, uh, uh, this ban for fear of being fined or having legal liabilities. But let's see, in conclusion here of my first piece, my first segment, which country has engaged in most wars? Which country has threatened world peace over the past 20 or 30 years? Is it Iraq, which has engaged in zero wars, has only been, been attacked by Iraq in 1982? Or is it the US, which has engaged in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in a bunch of other places, Syria, you name it? Let's see. I leave it up to you, but certainly Ira Iran is not a rogue country. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. So what are the makings of a rogue country, one might ask? One thing is to be labeled as such, that's not strong enough. I agree with that. But there are facts that this observation that Iran is a, a force for bad in the world actually is footed on. So let's look at Iran objectively. You have a rule of law that is subject to the main, let's call them dictating powers because you have like not only one dictator you have like three of them and the armies it's a very oppressive regime you cannot speak up there's no freedom of opinion there is no freedom of journalism there's no freedom of information if you are at odds with iran public policy then there is no freedom for you full stop iran has fought countless wars around the region so so many wars, you might ask yourself, what is the problem? Why does Iran need to be involved in so many fights around the region? And every single time they seem to deploy the same kind of tactic, finding the most extreme organization in the region, financing it through the roof, making sure it, they, those organizations have terrible weapons at, at hand, and then come in when the first damage is done and let's call it the victim is on the ground. That is what happened uh, with Iran's involvement in Syria, for instance. That is what happens in Libya. So there are, there are countless of wars where Iran is involved, sometimes openly, sometimes hiddenly. Actually, more often it is a hidden involvement than, than a public one. And often it is about destabilizing someone who's seen as competition on religious grounds, on economic grounds, you name it. Iran is not making a secret out of its agenda to damage Western players, to fight America and to fight Israel to a very existential degree. They are not claiming that they, they want to have a discussion over the state of Israel's policy or its place in the global landscape. They want to wipe it, I quote, highest public officials in Iran off the map. And that is that is a pretty extreme measure. If you combine that with Iran trying to get their hands on nuclear weapons and Iran running ballistic missile tests for 
years and years now, despite the the United Nations uh, demanding them to stop that and having weapons capability that can unleash a whole regional war while at the same time funding terrorist organization thousands of miles away, if that is not the definition of being a rogue state and a rogue player on the global stage, I don't know what is. And now on to Sebastian. Let me go through some of your points. Um, Israel is a contentious, contentious issue. As you said, it is true that a number of officials in Iran have depicted Israel as a country which needs to be wiped out. But also, as you said yourself, it is a complex political system where you have a number of parties of religious authorities uh, which contradict each other. Uh, my hope is that on the midterm and the long term, the, the, the peaceful parties are the ones which are, remain, are going to remain in power. There's not going to be any conflict with Israel. In fact, if Iran had wanted a conflict with, Iran, with Israel, they could have done so already. Uh, so I'm much more optimistic than you are. I think there's a lot of rhetoric, just like Trump is known for his very extravagant rhetoric. You mentioned uh, the funding of terrorist organizations. Well, here's a, another area of contention. This qualification of terrorism is also quite uh, ambiguous. Not all countries recognize the same organizations as terrorists. And, let's, and even if that were the case, let's look at what the US has done in Nicaragua just a few decades ago, 25 years ago, 29 years ago to be uh, more exact, with the Contras. Right? The US has funded this right-wing military group in Nicaragua because it was not happy that a communist regime was in power. So the US knows very much about this and funding these military groups or terrorist organizations, whatever you want to call them. So it's very difficult to give lessons to Iran for doing something very similar done by other countries in the past or even probably currently as well. You mentioned Iran is, a, is not really a democracy. It's an oppressive regime. Iran is hardly the only country. Um, do we call China, Russia, Cambodia as rogue countries because they're not democratic and they're probably even more corrupt? Uh, I state Cambodia because it's actually surprisingly one of the most corrupt countries in the world, uh, close to Somalia and North Korea. We don't call them rogue countries either. So I think there's a lot of double standards and rhetoric here. Two more points. Uh, if you look at the Paris Agreement a few years ago, which tried to curb Iran's capability to actually have a nuclear bomb, which party walked out of the deal? Is it Iran or is it the Europeans or is it the US? The answer is no. Trump walked out of the agreement as a result. As a result, just last week, Iran said, well, tough luck. The US walked out of the agreement. The agreement is not valid anymore. We have reached this level of enrichment of uranium, which is above the agreement limit. So the US here doesn't want to negotiate. Who doesn't want to talk? It's not Iran. It is the U.S. And finally, we talked briefly about the U.S. military drone, which was maybe shot down in international waters or not. But in any, in any case, I want to ask the question, what was the drone doing so close to Iran? Even if it were international waters, it was right next to Iran. Really? Really, the U.S. is not provoking a little bit? Now, I don't know who's to blame. It's true. We probably will never know, at least for a few decades, what really happened. But I really question the U.S.'s intention here. Iran is probably not an innocent, but the U.S. is certainly not. So pointing fingers and saying one is good, one is evil, is really simplifying the issue here. So we should be very careful of that rhetoric. And I don't, I will uh, maintain my claim that Iran is not a rogue country. Final statements. Dirk goes first. It's all rhetoric, you say. Iran is not doing anything, you say. You know what? You're wrong. Actually, it's documented that Iran launched multiple attacks against Israel and other states. The whole war in Syria can be seen as a replacement war. It's a battleground between Israel and Iran. There is an ongoing cyber war at this moment where Iranian forces are attacking critical infrastructure in Israel and the US, by the way, all the time. Israel and Iran exchanged fire more than you want to admit. And Iran is one of the reasons 
there is no end to the Arab-Israeli conflict in sight. Because whenever there is an opening for peaceful resolution to anything, Iran is one of the forces damaging that effort. So your statements are just plain wrong. Iran is playing, is a bad actor in the region. Iran is killing people, shooting missiles. In fact, they shot in 2018 in one incident more than 20 missiles towards Israel that were intercepted. Iran definitely is a force for violence, a force for conflict, a force for chaos, and as such a rogue state lurking in the shadows. Sebastian. Three things in conclusion. Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, and even the USA are no better than Iran on so many levels. Yes, it is true Iran is not innocent. But Iran has not engaged directly into any war, any conflict for decades, for decades. Russia was involved in Ukraine directly. The US engaged in a war in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Iran dares to have an independent opinion, dares to challenge the status quo imposed by the US. Iran tries to be a regional power, and so what? Every country tries to have a say in its regional politics or international politics. So this, this finger-pointing, this name-shaming, this, these insults, and walking out of the negotiation table on the part of the US are all demonstrations of a fear of a superpower, which is still the case of the US, which is afraid of not having as much influence as it would like to have. Iran is not a rogue country. It's just a country which tries to exist in itself and impose its view regionally, just like any other country which has the means to do so. So by no means, Iran is a rogue country for doing all this. Going full circle, I can tell you enjoyed this debate, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I realized by, by being, um, by going to this debate or by debating and, and expressing things, I'm probably more entrenched into this opinion indeed that, but I already had that opinion before that the US is a bit of a joke when it comes to, uh, international, uh, positions or st stances and, and what to do to solve international conflict. I mean, especially with the current government, but even before Trump being in, in being power, I feel that the US has little, little to say in terms of giving lessons to others. But I do, I do want to stress, it's true that Iran is, is, uh, has strength, power, could do a lot of damage, but I don't think they're going beyond what anyone would do, uh, I think, in their position. Yeah, that is something I found very interesting as well when I, I researched the topic. Um, it, is, it is hard to make the difference between actions that we as the West are engaged in. I don't want to point at the US alone, by the way, even though I, I admit Trump is following a pattern that the US was following for a longer time. He actually, it didn't change policy towards Iran. The only thing is he broke the contract with Iran. But uh, it was, you know, Regime change is a explicit state policy of the U.S. and has been for decades. So um, they and the U.S. was never shy of of investing a lot of money into quite a number of rogue organizations and uh, wiping countries off the map is something not foreign to the U.S. either. But I was starting with saying the West because in the end it's not only the U.S. It seemed to be a policy in all of the Western world that we we kind of um, put countries into buckets of useful for us and not useful for us. And as soon as we have a country in not useful for us, we, we amp up the rhetoric. And at some point, it almost always ends with violence and aggressive acts. And that was a, was a challenge researching Iran or the entire topic, not only for the complexity, but also because you, I, it felt like really hard to raise that cloak of uh, biased reporting. So um, Iran, of course, uh, is depicted as the country that strives for the, for the bomb. 
and we are all up in arms about it and, and crazy about it, completely forgetting that there are plenty of countries around this globe that have nuclear bomb. And so far, only one country actually dared to throw the nuclear bomb. For all the other countries, it seemed to have a very sobering, very peace driving effect to have that kind of power. So as soon as you have a nuclear bomb, it looks like people engage with you in negotiations and that is likely to lead for peaceful resolutions, not necessarily for the nuclear bomb being thrown. Uh, yet everybody seemed to color Iran as the axis of evil because everybody is scared about the bomb which we know how it looks like because the West actually used it in the past. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, a very weird, it's a very weird setup where I actually don't know what to make out of it. The fact of the matter, though, seem to be that, and that may be as well a result of the West pushing down on Iran and leaving Iran very little choice, but the, 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 the weapon of choice for Iran seemed to be to invest in in what we would call global terrorism. So there are a lot of groups that are brutal, that are coming up because Iran gave them money or because sometimes Iran even continues supporting them because, you know, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. That seemed to be sometimes the kind of policy Iran is engaging in. And, um, and that, that is what conflicts me at the end. So I don't think Iran is actually fostering peace or driving peace in the region either. So there is a lot of criticism um, that is well warranted. Not necessarily the criticism that we read in the news. And that, that is what I said earlier. If you, if you look at the news, it feels like there's a lot of, lot of crap there written by people who have no idea what they're writing about. Uh, I, I don't know, actually. I, I feel the... I actually feel the news are, are fairly balanced about Iran and the reason I say this is because I feel it's less dramatic than when, when you talk about Iran versus North Korea, for instance. So let me, <clears> let, me, <throat> let me go through the three points you mentioned, at least the way I, I see them as three points. One is the nuclear aspect. I'm actually not worried about it because it's just for, for Iran to reach the state of military power that Israel already has. Israel has the nuclear bomb, although it doesn't admit it has. So for me, it's just a balance of power, nothing more. Nobody's going to use the bomb. I don't think they're like, they're crazy. Um, I mean, if Iran were to launch the bomb or provoke a war, it's fairly obvious to me that every, every other country, uh, Western country, Europe and the US would intervene. I don't see how things would be static. Uh, I, anyway, my point is, I don't think they're crazy enough to do this. I think it's more about balance of power and telling Israel in particular, hey, just don't mess with us because we have it too. Um, the th second thing, terrorism groups, yes, it does bother me too. Um, but as I said, I think there's controversy on what is terrorism or not. Hezbollah is, uh, but maybe not, not other groups. I don't know the details. I think it's just playing, I think it, it's the, the problem with Iran here, it seems that it doesn't have a choice and that leads, leads me to the third point. Why does it not have a choice? It's because of this, what I consider completely stupid religious myth, myths, i.e. Shias versus Sunnis, uh, or any religion for that matter. But because it's so adamant about its religious dogma, it feels that the only way to sustain that religious, religious dogma is by destabilizing governments in the region which have the opposite religi religious view. Um, so I feel I feel that this is triggered by religion more than anything else, which seems completely absurd to me and to a lot of people. So I don't know if it's so much terrorism as much as trying to retain its foothold and its religious influence, uh, which is driving a lot of this fanatism. Um, but to the point of actually trying to to be destructive um, to another country, I'm not I'm not so sure. I think it's that's that's why it's so complex. It's religion mingled with nationalism, mingled with hatred or historical hatred uh, with Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. It's, it's just a mix of all these things. So that's why I'm not so worried about Iran, actually. And that's probably why the EU in general has a much softer attitude towards Iran. Uh, I feel, at least that's what I read when I, when I look at the German and French attitude, which are often the ones driving the, the agreements with Iran. Um, and there's also a lot of French companies which I've tried to... Uh, enter the Iranian market, but they had to leave again because Trump got, got out of the Paris Agreement, which makes it, which makes trade almost impossible with Iran. So, so I'm much more nuanced, I think, in, in my assessment of Iran, 
Although in, during the debate, I try to be much more defensive. But overall, I'm I'm fairly fairly comfortable. I don't like the religious autocratic regime, but it, it's kind of a half-hearted democracy. There's just a, a very strong religious <coughs> pressure, um, but there is a democracy in some ways. Right? They have presidential elections. People do vote. Yeah, and that is maybe another question: Is it really our place to bring democracy to the world? And is it always better to bring democracy to the world? I mean, we had other debates around this, right? But uh, it, it's quite arrogant to assume our system is the one system we need to to mission everybody else to. Um, and as far as the bomb goes, if anything became evident in the past couple of months is as soon as you have the bomb, then you can develop a really close relationship with the most powerful leader in the world. Even if you're a brutal dictator, on record killing people left and right and uh, oppressing your people. Well, who cares? If you have the bomb, then the American president is making yeah. surprise visits to you and uh, uh, writes your love letters. So uh, if I would be in power in the Iran, I might, I might continue pressing for this as well, um, uh, to be completely honest. It's, yes, it is a balance of power thing. Um, on the other hand, make no mistake, there is a war going on. Everything that's cheap enough to be done is done by Iran. I mentioned the cyber war capabilities of Iran. Hacking is incredibly cheap to have. And Iran is one of the big players on the world stage when it comes to uh, disruptive activities online. Um, But as much as Russia? Would you say as much as Russia? I mean, based on what I'm reading, it seems like Iran is, is, is tiny, is a dwarf compared to what Russia is trying to do. Everybody is tiny compared to what the US and Russia is trying to do. Uh, the US, Russia and but China, hang on, maybe. Hang on. You, say this, you say this, but Russia is only 140 million people and Iran is close to 90 million. Now, it's not just about demographics. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Not just about demographics, but just to give a sense, Russia, in my opinion, is losing very quickly its power. And unless it manages to use it, whatever, Arctic resources or finds a way out, I don't give a lot of positive future for Russia. And that's probably why Putin and others are trying to, I don't know, maybe it's self-gain, maybe it's nationalistic pride, I don't know. But I, I don't think it's it's that obvious that Russia is by default a big power and Iran is not. But I do, I, it does seem from what, we, from what I'm reading that Iran is trying to be disruptive, but is nothing in comparison to China or Russia. I don't know. It feels it's trying to do what anyone would do in their shoes. Like if Germany or France were was Iran, we'd probably have spies and you know small like stint operations in other countries that we don't like too much. In fact, we did this. French did this in against Greenpeace, but when we sank, sank the Greenpeace boat in New Zealand, right, killing the photographer on board. Right, how how lame is this? That was the at the end of the 1980s or early 1980s. I can't remember. Right, how lame is this? It's supposed to be a democracy, right? And we sink a Greenpeace boat. Oh, come on. You got to be kidding. If it were Iran, you'd not be surprised. If it were North Korea, you'd say, yeah, of course. France? That was less than 30 years ago. All right, so my point here is, I don't know. I, I feel that any, any democracy would probably do something similar. And it's not that extreme. Now, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm completely missing the point. And again, you're right. Some people have said they want to destroy Israel. And this cannot be defended. But this is not all Iranians. It's a big country. Like, it's 85, what, 90 million people? Yeah, so... Full disclosure, I'm actually, um, I'm also playing devil advocate to a large extent. So I feel similar to what you just said. Um, I think, by the way, we keep coming back to Israel. I feel I, uh, it is it's an interesting aspect that Iran, of all countries on the map, they want to wipe out Israel, which is a special case. It's like immediately a high cooking case because it's Israel. Israel is a very close ally, an extreme close, extremely close ally to the U.S. Um, it's it's very very threatened within the region anyway. So saying you want to wipe out Israel of all countries, they are not they're not saying they want to wipe out Saudi Arabia, for instance. They 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 say that about Israel, and that is a very destabilizing statement in itself. But I would say. No country should threaten any other country to wipe it out. <laughs> And full stop. That is that in alone, that act of aggression alone qualifies you at least to be not uh, a, a full 
full open friendly player on the world stage. Um, and I doubt that France or today's Germany, <laughs> maybe maybe not the Germany um, 70 years ago or 80 years ago, but uh, maybe th 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 let's focus on today's Germany, would threaten any nation um, with being wiped out. Um, That's and fair. I do think um, the kind of organization, uh, organizations like Hezbollah, Iran is affiliating with, it's kind of a catastrophe in waiting and they know it. And like they, they kind of take into account that they basically fund brutal criminals that are killing people on the world stage, not only in the region. So they, they fund uh, activities that are actually, well... A shame for any any democracy, any country that that wants to be taken seriously on the world stage. So that that is basically where where I would tend to agree that Iran is a bad player. That being said, the Western world is bad player in many of these things as well. So um, and I we keep coming back to the U.S. because it's so damn visible right now because it's so powerful. And yes, Europe takes a weaker stance at the moment. But Europe has their share on escalating issues in the Middle East as well, for shady reasons. It's sometimes having access to cheap oil. Sometimes it's just, it's also, if Iran would get into a really powerful position, that would force, uh, that would put a problem in front of the Western world because it's uh, such a different uh, negotiation position as well. Um, so um, I'm, I'm torn here, let's put it that way. Anyway, to so listeners, are you torn as well? How do you feel about this debate? How we presented a bit of a summary of the situation, R irrespective of how you feel about Iran, by the way, because you may have your biases, um, especially when it comes to the Middle East. It's easy to have a, a bias. Um, so, what do you think? Let us know. Vote on todebate.eu. Thumbs up, thumbs down. You can email us as usual. And uh, that's it for today. You can tune in for our next debate very soon excellent thank you any final words before the nuclear bomb is dropped by some random country yeah maybe it's switzerland developing the bomb secretly uh, i'm Ma sure maybe maybe yeah. that's yeah. worth another debate uh, uh well france has the bomb uh germany is allowed to use the one u.s bomb <laughs> they have <laughs> everybody should have a nuclear bomb maybe that's the making of a debate <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the making of a debate. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. We shall be back. All right. All right. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. Thank you for listening. <laughs>